Um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Yoko Schreiber, who is uh, an infectious disease specialist based in Sioux Lookout. And she, I'm going to let her introduce herself okay. and all her qualifications. Okay, so yes, I'm, I'm Yoko Schreiber. Um, I'm an ID specialist. I just moved to Sioux Lookout in August. I've had been coming here for a few years, though, before that. I'm um, in practice based in Ottawa uh, prior to that. So currently, I'm still affiliated with the University of Ottawa Hospital um, and still do some service there. But um, my main practice is to look at Manoyawan Hospital. Um, I'm also involved uh, with NOSM and um, act as a consultant to the PNT Committee at FNIB nationally. Um, as well as a consultant of First Nations, so look at First Nations Health Authority and some of their policies and infectious disease activities. And lastly, I'm also the Indigenous Health Chair at AMI Canada. So um, those are sort of all my affiliations. I don't think there's any conflicts of interest here. And I'm also not going to make any off-label uh, therapeutic recommendations here. So I think we can start. Oh, so this one, okay, sorry, go backwards. So the objectives for this talk, we're talking, going to talk about anaplasmosis. Um, hopefully by the end of it, you will be able to recognize that anaplasma phagocytophilum um, is an emerging tick-borne pathogen in northwestern Ontario. Um, hopefully you'll be able to uh, describe the clinical signs and symptoms of those um, with HGA. And um, the other important issue we want to bring up is recognizing when people may be co-infected with anaplasma and um, Lyme or maybe other tick-borne uh, illnesses. And then once you have someone with anaplasmosis that you'll be able to um, select the appropriate management for your patients. So I don't know if anybody has seen anybody with anaplasmosis here already. No, okay. Do you have friends who are vets? No? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm keeping going the wrong one. So what is anaplasmosis? So we're going to refer to it as anaplasmosis, but uh, just to be clear, so the organism is anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is, um, that's the organism. And the uh, illness often you will see referred to in books is human granulous cytotropic anaplasmosis, HGA. So usually in short, anaplasmosis, what we call it. So initially it was described as a veterinary illness, and that's why I asked whether you have friends who are vets, just because it still um, tends to be more common still now in um, animals as opposed to humans, um, presenting with similar symptoms. Um, and I think vets probably are more aware of this even here in the region um, than physicians because it's fairly new um, and involving emerging infection in humans, um, especially in this region. So the first human case was actually 1994. Um, previously was lumped under uh, ehrlichiosis, um, which we now no is different. Um, it's ehrlichiosis refers to infection caused by ehrlichia shafiensis um, and causes HME. Um, and then anaplasmosis is a different illness. And now I'll go over some differences later. Um, but yeah, so they're two different entities. Um, however, Ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis all evolve from a common ancestors, similar as some of the rickettsial infections, Wolbachia, Orensia, which we don't hear, see here, and um, neorickettsiae. So what that in the end means, and I think that's one of the take home messages, they're all susceptible to doxycycline. And doxycycline is a treatment for choice of all of, for all of these. So anaplasma phagocytophilum is an intracellular organism, which becomes important later when we talk about uh, diagnosis. Um, there is some antigenic variations between the strains. So if you have infections with one anaplasma species, um, you can be reinfected with another one because you don't have full immunity because there are some antigenic uh, um, differences between the strains. Um, in terms of pathophysiology, I don't know if you're interested in that, but there's a, a protein called ANK-A, which mediates cell wall entries, but um, influence host gene on transcription. And this is important because it will mediate the effect on your progenitor cells, and that's why you may get uh, like some of the clinical findings associated with anaplasmosis, like thrombocytopenia and leukopenia. Um, what you do see um, on the smear, um, which just didn't come up, I think it changed the format a little bit. There was a picture here um, that I can use about where you could see sort of a morula with the intracellular organisms there, like in um, a circulating neutrophil. So sorry, that picture didn't come out. It was rearranged. 
Um, so sometimes you can pick it up on a smear. So when you have someone that where you suspect a tick-borne infection, your story matters. And I'm just gonna share a bit of a story which will help you um, think about the important components of the history that you're taking of a patient. So when I was working at the Civic Hospital, which is in Ottawa, a tertiary care center, the patient transferred from Nunavut had been in hospital uh, for one week and I got called for a tick on him. So when I go to see him, he claims, no, he was in hospital. The tick definitely wasn't there on transfer. Um, you know, there is no ticks in Nunavut as per to him. He says he's definitely got it at the Civic. I'm like, okay, come on, this is crazy. Like, why would you get a, uh, um, a tick in the hospital? So turns out he was telling the truth. Um, you know, we I went over exposures. He didn't have any pets. He wasn't outside. He was hospitalized for several weeks before in Nunavut. Um, and a tick actually we sent it into the public health lab it was a dermacenter tick is not there in Nunavut so it was a locally acquired in hospital acquired tick infection um, probably the first in Ottawa um, but again when you have someone with a tick the history what you want to uh, find out is exposures right so where do they live where do they come from what kind of activities do they have and also know your local epidemiology in terms of illnesses but also what ticks are in your regions do you have the exodus ticks do you have the dermacenter ticks and what um, diseases do they carry because even though you may have a tick maybe they don't carry the same um, diseases as in other regions and obviously know where their patients are coming from um, you may see them here but maybe they traveled up from Michigan because they're here for fishing or they've been exposed somewhere else so these are all important considerations you also want to have a good sense of time so for my patients he's been in hospital for several weeks in the end so unlikely that the tick will stay on for several weeks so your time of exposure in terms of um, assessing risk for certain infections like Lyme disease or uh, anaplasmosis um, will dictate um, what you what you think may be going on for example the time of attachment for Lyme disease is 36 hours or more for anaplasmosis it's four hours um, so have a good sense of time do a good review of system and as we did here sometimes you can send it, the ticks to the lab to be identified and then different ticks carry different diseases so you will know um, you know what you would be at risk for so the ticks that carry anaplasma are the exodus scapularis and exodus pacificus so let's get this little box okay. keep going it's okay um, there's also other ticks in Europe and Asia that carry anaplasma, but you don't have to worry about them unless you have someone traveling uh, there. What we here see here in our region is the Exodus scapularis. Exodus pacificus is really on the west coast, um, North America, that we see that, but they both carry anaplasma and Lyme disease, as you know. So now it's not moving. Sorry. I'm not so sure if it's not. Sorry, my slides aren't moving so well. Can you go over this down here? Okay. Yeah, so um, I think the graphics were a little changed. So what you hear, see this is the picture of the Exodus scapularis ticks. Um, they come in different stages. It's a living organism, so they start as larvae, become nymphs, adult males, adult females, um, and there's differences in size, but that's what it looks like. Why do I put a picture of a bagel on there? Um, is not any errors are messed up, but um, the adult female is about as big as a sesame seed, and a larva, which is also can transmit the illness, is as big as a poppy seed. So this gives you a bit of a sense of of size when you're thinking about ticks and you know what form was it? Was it engorged? Um, and what stage was it in? How is it transmitted? So you have lots of animals that may be infected with anaplasma, the ticks feed, and then transmit it to humans. Um, a number of different animal hosts exist. So uh, the white-footed mouse is a common one, white-tailed deer, which we what we see here. I don't know about the other deer, I'm not a hunter, so I don't know what kind of other deer we see here, if they just... Pardon? None of those. None of those? Okay, thank you. But you have dogs, cats, sheep maybe 
I mean, as Eggly's farm, um, cattle, horses. Mm. And as I mentioned, it's a, an important veterinary illness and animals can be hosts to anaplasmosis. Um, and so it's always good to ask if you're a farmer, have there been any, any sick animals, sick pets, um, presenting similar to humans with like lethargy, fatigue, often like spontaneous abortion of their um, offspring. And um, yeah, just general lethargy is one of the signs. So I'll get Kit to talk a little bit about the local epidemiology. Yep. Um, so in Canada, you can find anaplasmosis in um, a number of provinces. So there are higher rates in Manitoba, mm -hmm. Quebec, um, New Brunswick, and also you can find it in Ontario and Nova Scotia. Anaplasmosis is not reportable in Ontario though. So we don't have, the local health units don't have actual data on anaplasmosis. We did call the public health lab to find out if you know samples are being sent in for anaplasmosis. And between 2013 and 2017, five samples were sent in. One was positive for anaplasmosis and one was two were um, borderline positive. So not really helpful data. Right? So we really don't have a good sense of what, how many cases there are in, in Ontario. However, um, in our region, we're close to uh, two areas where it's reportable. So in, in Manitoba, anaplasmosis has been reportable since January 2015. Um, so that's only been three years. Therefore, they don't have a whole lot of data. And you can see the numbers are relatively small. So it'll, it'll take some time to really figure out what the situation is from an epidemiological perspective in Manitoba. This is US data, and it shows um, various states. And it, the, the states that are colored red have the highest rates of anaplasmosis incidence. And you can see that um, Minnesota is red. So we are right next to a, a US state that has high rates of anaplasmosis, relatively high rates of anaplasmosis. Um, this is from Minnesota, Minnesota's Department of Health website. And you can see that since they've made it reportable, the number of cases have been increasing over time. Uh, this, um, this graph is from CDC, and it shows that there is a seasonality to anaplasmosis. So rates tend to be higher in July, June and July, and there's similar types of seasonality being seen in Manitoba, maybe a little bit higher in May as well. So it's just to, to be aware of when cases tend to occur. Um, according to age and gender, there it tends to be higher rates in older age groups and higher rates in men. And this is US data that we're looking at here. So in, in addition to looking at human cases, we also at local public health, we look at tick surveillance. And so there are two different types of tick surveillance we do. There's passive tick surveillance and active tick surveillance. So in passive tick surveillance, um, individuals bring in ticks and we collect them. And if they're a black legged tick, they get sent for testing. For active um, tick surveillance, there's a picture of it up there in the, in the slide. And so essentially they put on a hazmat suit and they drag um, a, a white piece of cloth and they have to follow a provincial protocol when they collect the ticks. So they, they have to drag at least for three person hours. So it's either one person dragging for three hours or three people dragging for one hour. And then they collect the ticks, they, they pick off the ones that are black legged ticks and send it in for testing. Um, this year, we're doing something new. We have a new app that can be downloaded. So please, anyone in the public can download this app and so this way you can take a picture of a tick if you find one, it gets sent to the health unit and they, they let you know um, what type of tick it is. So it's just another way for us to do surveillance. You can also attach like where you found the tick and so on so that we know what, what location. Um, the 2017 passive tick surveillance for results, we collected 354 ticks. Um, only 72 of them were black-legged ticks, and none of the ticks were positive, positive for the um, bacteria that causes anaplasmosis. Um, you should know that tick numbers, tick submission numbers, this is passive surveillance, this is people bringing in ticks to the local health units, have been increasing over time. So from 2014 to 2017, we've seen an increase in the number of ticks being submitted. Um, and that, that's not only black-legged ticks, but also um, um, wood ticks as well. So for the active surveillance, this is when they, we do the tick dragging. Um, we, we, in 2017, we dragged a number of locations in Kenora and around Kenora. Um, the locations were chosen for um, if, they, if, if people were identifying it as a place where they had positive ticks. Um, also places, we, we did contact MNR and ask them where there were oak species plants. 
um, so that we can, where they're more likely to find ticks, and we specifically dragged in those areas. And we also drag where there's um, where the public tend to visit, so public trails. So during the 2017 active tick dragging, we got we collected 101 black-legged ticks. And of these, um, and we co we collect ticks in both the spring and the fall. In the spring, none of the ticks were positive for anaplasmosis, but in the fall, we did find eight of the 39 black-legged ticks were positive for um, anaplasmosis. So that's about 20 percent which is a bit higher than the surveillance numbers that are being seen in Manitoba. So we felt it was important to um, inform healthcare providers and, and the, the public will also be informed. So these are the um, testing locations mm -hmm. in the fall um, in the Kenora area um, for 2017. And it shows specifically the number of ticks, number of black-legged ticks and the number <laughs> of those that were positive and the percents that were positive for anaplasmosis. Now, I want to do a quick update on Lyme disease because that's another thing that we do surveillance on when we're testing ticks. Um, so in the passive surveillance um, results for Lyme disease of the uh, 72 black-legged ticks, 14% were positive for the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So that's, in the end, that's only 10 ticks. Five were from the Rainy River District, three from the Kenora District, and one from Sioux Narrows and one from Red Lake. Um, and you can see that for um, Lyme disease, the percent of ticks that are positive, like the ticks that are submitted to the health unit has increased over time. So from 2016 and 2017 are higher than 2014 and 2015. So the, the actual number of ticks have increased, but also the percent positivity has increased. Uh, this is the active tick surveillance results for 2017, both the spring and fall numbers combined. And so this is um, relatively new information. I've not released this before. And you can see that the overall positivity rate is 60%. Um, and if you, it, the main driver though is one location in Kenora for this, um, this particular statistic. But having said that, the other locations are also showing higher positivity rates for Lyme disease in the ticks. So this therefore mm -hmm. is relevant for the, um, the, the prophylaxis recommendations that are that are provided in the guidelines. Do you have a question? Where is uh, McKinsey Portage Area Site 1? Right by your house. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that in comparison to Site 2? Um, so the thing is that we didn't uh, identify the actual site because it, in the end these there was no random sampling. Like it, it was not random sampling. So that's one of the limitations of the data. We did choose according to vegetation. So these are highly vegetated areas. I think both Mackenzie Portage sites are highly vegetated. They're next to oak vegetation. They're somewhat chosen sort of um, ad hoc, but it's not a random sample. So we felt it wasn't important to identify the actual location, but it is important to get a sense that highly vegetated areas, particularly if they have oak species vegetation, in the Kenora area appears to have high rates of um, ticks and potentially high rates of Lyme disease. It does make the data is a bit tricky to interpret because one, we didn't do a random sample and two, some of the numbers are really small. So you can see that for site number one, the first the first um, Mackenzie Portage area site number one, that, that's where we got the most number of ticks, but all the other sites only had relatively small numbers. So we are um, trying to interpret evidence where there's a fair bit of small numbers, and so that makes it tricky to interpret. We do feel, though, that um, so how are we going to describe this risk to the public is that there is um, a risk of Lyme disease in the region, that that risk increases substantially once you're um, walking through very wooded, bushy areas, if you're not wearing appropriate clothing, if you're not using DEET, if you're not staying towards the center of the trail, um, and so that, 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 that risk increases for Lyme disease, and you can therefore reduce your risk by doing things like taking protective measures and doing a body check and removing the tick as soon as possible after you've, you've finished. So it is a little hard to quantify the risk from, uh, from your perspective. So I'm imagining for healthcare providers, it is a little bit of a judgment call. Having said that, we did discuss the results with Public Health Ontario and they do feel that it's, you know, it's, the results do indicate it's above that 20% threshold that's, rec that's um, outlined in the guidelines. And so therefore prophylaxis can be considered if someone comes in with a tick that's been on for more than 24 hours. And um, Yoko's going to go, go over that in a little bit more detail. Any questions? Any other questions? Yep. Your um, instance, which was shows age related, was puzzling because it's, you took it from zero to, a, a, to the elderly. It was a parabolic curve. It suggests a logarithmic growth. 
Well, 65 year olds are not in the bush as much as 16 year olds. So it doesn't make sense. So is that serological positivity sort of lifetime, lifetime exposure or is it incidence? I wasn't quite clear from your uh, from the slide. Yeah. Or your yeah. Yeah. So maybe I'll just go back to it. Um, and you know what? I, I have to say, I didn't. I don't know if it, it is. It does state incidence. So this is taken from the CDC. That absolutely doesn't make any sense, does it? See, well, I mean, we also know that is there's increased risk if they're immunocompromised. So maybe there's a perhaps part of um, you know, the comorbidities that occur at older ages. Perhaps that's that's part of it. But the my understanding is that incidence rates are higher in older age groups, particularly over the age of 40, and that's what the CDC reports. Yeah, I think it did maybe media this to people at the later ages um, tend to have more severe infection with anaplasmosis and maybe that present more often to the healthcare center and therefore get tested. I mean, if you're looking at anaplasmosis incidents and you're gonna talk about testing and we're looking for serology, not just like one time, but you're looking for an increase in titer. So I would have assumed they would have done that in terms of looking at incidents, but I'm assuming this. Or it's a type of a serological prevalence. prevalence. Well, I, I I would find it hard that CDC I would find it hard to imagine that CDC would make the, the mistake Donald between <laughs> not the incidents CDC. and the prevalence. Science isn't really big in the country right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big science. Okay, I'm not going to speculate on that, and this is being recorded, by the way. <laughs> okay, so um, so okay, so I've just gone over the so this Lyme the Lyme disease that results are new. I just want to point out that we will be communicating this to all healthcare providers in writing with clear recommendations. I also know that Public Health Ontario is um, developing some tools along the along um, to provide guidance to healthcare providers on prophylaxis. So hopefully we'll be able to include those type of tools in more formal communication. Um, go ahead. You mentioned that you got this app to identify ticks. Is it that you still want them to give you the deer ticks if they're identified as deer ticks for your passive surveillance? Or yeah, we're still like we're we're still accepting um, ticks for passive surveillance. Um, and yes, it would be just to, so that people can before they come and drop you off a little tick. Yeah, and say yes or no, that's a deer tick. And if it is a deer tick, are they being told to bring it into the lab? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the question was if the um, if you use the app, if you'd still be asked to bring in the, the tick, and the answer is yes, assuming it is a deer tick. Um, so my understanding is that anybody can help you testing as well, is that right? Testing of the tick? No, testing of themselves. No, no, we don't do we don't do um, serology at all for human for humans. So we definitely do not do that. I, I, we wouldn't have the capacity to like follow up on individuals. Like, that's that's to us um, the role of the healthcare provider. Okay, just came and told me that. That's why I asked. Yeah, I'm not sure why that why she said that. Oh, he or she said that. I'm glad we're on the map because now we're the voting capital of North America, the Blasto capital, <laughs> and a hot spot for Lyme disease. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we are we are right now the Kenora region. I shouldn't say we, but the Kenora region is on the a high risk area in the Lyme disease map. So a risk area is anywhere where there's an established tick population, black-legged tick population. So it's not even necessarily that they need to be positive for Lyme disease, but it's an established tick, black-legged tick population. There's also an area um, outside of the municipality of Rainy River that is considered a risk area. Um, just to kind of go over the, the prevention messaging for patients, so it'd be things such as to inspect yourself soon after you've been outdoors, um, Removing the ticks quickly would mean that you're at reduced risk of Lyme disease or anaplasmosis. Um, try staying in the center of the trail, avoiding long grass, wearing light colored clothing that covers as much skin as possible, use insect repellents such as DEET, um, and consider thinking about your pets, so whether it is um, removing ticks off them or visiting your vet to get the appropriate um, protection for your animal. And so a new key message for patients because of the new Lyme disease information is to consider visiting your healthcare provider if a tick is attached for more than 24 hours. Do most people know that? Do most people know that? They know that the tick's been on them for 24 hours? So, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 so that's just a... Yeah. But you would also know from your time up, like, oh, well, I went hiking yesterday morning, right? As opposed to, and then it's like three days later, I noticed it, and it's probably from like when you were hiking. Yeah. That's right. Or from, what is the thing? It could have fallen off and got on you from the clothing that you put on the floor or whatever, right? Like, yeah. 
So they do look at engorgement to see how long it's been on. And then, yeah, I guess just a history. Um, we, right now, we haven't actually come up with the exact wording of how we're going to put that up on the website and, and communication material. But because I guarantee everybody's going to come in saying it's been on for 24 hours. Yeah. Like, so, I, think, I think that's what people are going to if you give the time frame. Say, well, Do you want me to avoid giving a time frame? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, well, I mean, we go with happen, relatively. I don't think that's not my been my experience in Ottawa. Like Ottawa has been an endemic area, I think, for the last couple of years now. Um, I mean, that changed recently too. And um, yeah, I don't, I have, I don't have the experience. I'm not in the merge, but uh, okay. people are not thinking like or trying to fudge the times or anything. It's not been my experience. But. What, what's the media presence like in Ottawa? Like around here, we have Lyme, Ontario, but pamphlets and billboards up in all our public places. Same. All of them. Same. And it's a small area, so right. the public are getting that information all the time. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. All your major rec centers and so forth. Okay. And um, one more question. Does it take a certain amount of time uh, for the erythema in the area after a bite to develop? And is that something that could be helpful for a duration of which it's been lodged in the skin? Well, some people will also never get erythema, right? Oh, so you can't really necessarily, um, it cannot, can't be helpful. Okay. Okay. Um, so then going back to anaplasmosis, so just in terms of clinical presentation, so after you get an infection, you have hematogenous dissemination to the bone marrow and spleen, where then it will affect the, um, the progenitor cells and um, will cause some of the thrombocytopenias and uh, neutropenias that you may see. So the incubation period for anaplasmosis is about one to two weeks after tick bite. Again, for anaplasmosis, you only need the tick to be on for four hours. Um, clinical presentation can have variable severity. Some people will just have a mild flu-like illness. Some people can be quite ill with it. Um, typically presenting with fever, headache, malaise, myalgias. Um, GI symptoms only present in less than 50% of cases. Um, some people will present with an uh, meningitis encephalitis picture. Um, however, that's rare in anaplasmosis. Um, and typically with anaplasmosis, you don't get a rash. So if you have a patient that presents with a rash and these symptoms, then you should consider co-infection. On exam, signs again, like fever, documented fever, lethargy. Sometimes you can, with people who are quite sick, have respiratory distress, surge, shock, rhabdomyolysis, hemorrhage from the thrombocytopenia. And because of the neutropenia, some people can present with opportunistic infections. So um, that's a consideration, although that's not common. Um, you can have some neurologic sequelae, um, but again, these are rare. So I think now as a clinician, if you're working in eMERGE or in clinic, you're faced with this clinical problem of this non-specific symptoms of like what I even consider like an influenza-like illness. You may have cough, you may not have cough, <laughs> but you have fever, malaise, myalgias. Sometimes they present as a fever at NYD. Um, sometimes they present as an FEO. So I, I had one of the cases, I think that was maybe one of the serologies that tested borderline um, recently, but it was a workup for an FUO. Um, they can be febrile for several weeks and uh, quite neutropenic and thrombocytopenic. So, and knowing that the differential can be quite huge. So how does that help you? The history is the most important thing. So I know when we're rushed, we tend to not take very extensive history, maybe as a luxury as an infectious disease physician should sit down and have take histories for 45 minutes. But this is where your epi links and exposure history comes in, in terms of figuring out if someone really has a flu, I guess you can test for that. But um, looking at these vague symptoms, I'm assessing a patient at risk for anaplasmosis. So again, history of tick bite, description of the tick, length of attachment, is important. Um, if people don't remember specifically a tick bite, but asking them about their recreational activities, are they going camping, hiking, are they going hunting? Maybe they had some sort of exposure that maybe puts you more thinking, oh, maybe this is blasto as opposed to anaplasmosis. Um, do they go caving? You know, then you think more about histo as on a differential diagnosis for these type of symptoms. 
have they traveled or do you think this is locally acquired? I mean, the epidemiology may vary if it's someone from uh, Minnesota versus someone from upstate New York versus someone from um, BC. So um, again, where have they traveled to uh, before they presented here? The immunization history, maybe it's a viral illness and they have not been immunized. Maybe this is mumps or measles or whatnot. So, I mean, these are all parts of your differential diagnosis. We don't tend to think about these when we think, oh, maybe this is Lyme disease. But again, you want to also look at your differential and not miss anything else. Have they had a history of blood transfusion? So some of these uh, vector-borne illnesses can be transmitted through blood transfusions. So your risk is lower if you have leukocyte depleted blood, but transmission still can occur. So um, just this, just one way uh, how you can get anaplasmosis as well if without a tick bite. Um, you want to ask about their social history, including risk assessment for STI, HIV. I mean, acute serotonin conversion to HIV presents similarly. Um, so that's also your differential diagnosis with the same symptoms. And who lives at home? Are they been any ill contacts? Not that anaplasmosis transmitted um, person to person, but flu is, and their pets may be sick with anaplasmosis, and that tells you maybe they've been exposed at the same time. Um, and then on the differential diagnosis with people with fevers, myalgias, autoimmune disease is always there, so family history is also important. And then lastly, you want to do an extensive review of system, because when someone comes in with fevers, myalgias, your differential is huge, but if someone comes in with fevers, myalgias, and hematuria, or um, things like that, or a conjunctivitis, again, that changes your differential hugely. So do a good review of systems when you see patients. So as I mentioned, the differential diagnosis is fairly large. Um, I just put on FEO as a very large differential diagnosis, but again, you want to look for specific signs and symptoms and the EpiLink. For vector-borne infections, Lyme disease can present similarly, obesiosis, ehrlichiosis, um, travel-associated uh, illnesses like malaria, dengue, chikungunya, zika can present similarly. Other viral infections like EBV, CMV, HIV, um, and um, other respiratory viruses, rheumatological diseases can present with fairly acute fever, and then um, many others. So when you have a patient that you may suspect has anaplasmosis, what, what do you do next? In terms of testing, you would want to do a CBC and look for thrombocytopenia and leukopenia. Anemia is usually mild. Um, all these abnormalities tend to resolve by day 14 of illness, so they're typically seen early. However, people can be quite sick with this, and obviously you want to try to get to day 14. Um, Keratinin and lights are also important. Some people can present with azotemia in severe cases, um, although not a lot of people will have normal keratinin still. You do see a mild hepatitis, and in most cases with anaplasmosis, especially early on. Um, coagulopathy, um, uncommon, but in severe cases mostly. And then you also want to rule out other things, like obviously you want to rule out an acute bacterial infection, because that's... Um, significant morbidity mortality if you would miss that. So you do blood cultures, you do LDH, you can do a blood smear, um, so especially with someone with a thrombocytopenia and leukopenia. I think they may be done automatically if um, the CBC is abnormal. And if you're lucky, maybe you can see the anaplasmosis on there or maybe give you a different um, uh, a differential diagnosis. And then rest of the stuff is really guided by symptoms. So um, again, you have to use your clinical judgment. So how do you differentiate all these tick-borne infections? Because you've heard we have Lyme disease, we now have maybe anaplasmosis, um, and then people may travel. I put Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain spotted fever on there because that's often talked about in a lot of documents on differential diagnosis. We don't see it here. Um, and I'll go in and, and a little bit later show you a map. It's actually not in the Rocky Mountains that you do see it, but you see it more centrally. Um, so you have people who are traveling and presenting here to emerge because, I mean, you have a lot of visitors from the U.S. in the summer. Um, you may think about it. So as I mentioned, rash is very uncommon in anaplasmosis. If you have rash, you think Lyme disease. Um, GI symptoms are uncommon. If you have GI symptoms, um, maybe allergiosis or other uh, other things. Vasculitis is not part of anaplasmosis, but it's part of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, cranial nerve palsies tends to be Lyme disease, um, typically not seen in anaplasmosis. 
now again suspect co-infection with someone with uh, anaplasmosis you have the serology back and they've had rash then you probably should also send the testing for mm -hmm. Lyme disease and if you have a patient with Lyme disease um, they have a serology back and they have prolonged fever or their CBC is still abnormal then you probably should also send the testing for anaplasmosis because CBC abnormalities are not common in uh, Lyme disease. So in terms of testing, what you can send is serology. Um, you could send it for PCR as well through the public health lab, and I think it gets sent to NML, and Kit is going to talk briefly about um, diagnostic testing. You can do send a blood smear, but again, um, the morelia are only present in 20%. I've read 80% in one of the textbooks, but a CDC website uh, quotes 20%, and I think that's what we've discussed is probably more likely, so not very sensitive, and typically only seen early in the disease. Um, your pathologist can be your friend. Um, I listed all the pathologic findings on there. I'm not a pathologist. I wouldn't know what to look at. So um, maybe Kelly can expand on we'll some of these findings. findings. Okay. All right. <laughs> so less likely to be useful. So I just want to point out that um, so the, the blood testing is not done in the public health lab. They take they, they accept the blood samples, but it's actually sent to the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg. So they're the ones who actually do the testing for anaplasmosis. Mm -hmm. So serology is the most sensitive and was the most commonly used test for anaplasmosis. Um, and you have to take two samples, an acute and convalescent, so that you can see that fourfold increase in IgG. Um, IgM also shows an increase over that period of time, but there are the potential for false positives with IgM. PCR is also positive, possible to um, use as a test, but it's less commonly used, and I think you have to request it to get it used. So, um, uh, but according to the National Micro Microbiology Lab website, they do do it for investigational or research purposes. Uh, there. It is sensitive in the first week of the illness, but despite being a higher sensitivity during the first week of the illness, a negative result is not good enough to um, exclude anaplasmosis. Um, testing after treatment has started also decreases the sensitivity. So the turnaround time for both these tests are relatively large. Um, it's supposed to be 21 days for PCR and 42 days for serology. So it's really not um, a quick turnaround time. If you felt you really want the turnaround time quickly, you can um, call the public health lab and ask for um, quicker results. Right, so uh, I think as Kit mentioned, the serology um, can be negative early in the illness. So I think if you have someone with severe illness that you're quite worried about it, I think maybe it's worthwhile to call the public health lab and do the PCR testing and maybe <laughs> helping you early on. Um, and I mean, knowing how long the tests take to come back and that early on in disease serology may be negative to begin with, your decision to treat or not to treat really is based on clinical grounds and EpiLink. And I recognize that this may be difficult given the types of symptoms that people with anaplasmosis present with, but essentially as a clinician, that's what you're gonna be left with. So the treatment of choice is doxycycline for all adults and all children. So there's good evidence showing that a course of doxycycline of two weeks, even in kids less than eight years old, doesn't really have any permanent um, adverse effects. Um, I think there was one study that looked at you can treat kids less than eight up to five times with a course of doxycycline, tetracycline, without um, having any permanent staining of the teeth. Um, so it is a treatment of choice even for younger kids. Duration seven to 14 days um, or three days after defervescence. So if you're somewhere between seven and 14 and you wanna whether you wanna stop, so you wanna wait three days after fever um, disappears. The dose is 100 milligrams POBID. You can also use tetracycline if that's what you have. And the pediatric dose is 2.2 milligrams per kilograms POBID if you're less than 45 uh, kilograms in weight. Now in pregnancy, um, for severe cases, the treatment of choice is still doxycycline because you want to treat the mom. Um, if you're quite worried about um, death in a patient, um, but however, the mild illness you can consider rifampin instead of doxycycline. Um, so the mild in terms of non-life-threatening illness, or if someone has, has a severe life-threatening allergy to um, doxycycline, you can choose rifampin. 
However, that being said, if you're not sure about like co-infections such as Lyme disease or maybe Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which we don't have here, recognizing that rifampin doesn't treat those. So doxycycline is really your treatment of choice for any sort of rickettsial, Lyme, um, or anaplasmosis infection. You covered all your bases. If you go with rifampin, you have to really strongly consider um, co-infections and whether we need to treat them with an alternate agent or not. At this time, there's no evidence to recommend prophylaxis after a tick bite. So if someone comes in, oh, I've had a exodus tick that's been there for more than four hours, I'm really worried about, anapl about anaplasmosis, but they don't have any symptoms, there's no recommendation to prophylax at this time, so no antibiotics. Um, and just recognizing that you can have more severe disease in immunocompromised hosts. So in terms of when you decide to uh, treat on clinical grounds, again, consider your patients and underlying immunosuppression. <clears throat> so a quick update on Lyme disease. As Kit already mentioned, this is now considered an endemic um, region. So just a review of when should you consider prophylaxis after a tick bite. Um, this is from the PHAC website, um, which is consistent with the CDC uh, recommendations as well. So you prophylax after all these four criteria are met. So the tick is consistent with an exodes or a black leg tick, and it has to be attached for more than 36 hours. Um, you prophylax only if the patient presents within 72 hours after tick removal. If it was five days ago, there's no point of prophylaxing anymore. Mm. Um, and the local rate of Borrelia burgdorferi infection in ticks is more than 20%, which we know is the case here in some of the more uh, wooded areas. And then doxycycline is not contraindicated. The prophylaxis dose is one dose of doxycycline, 200 milligrams orally once, and again, calculating by weight um, for uh, kids or uh, smaller patients. Yeah? How can you tell, how does the person know if the, if the ticket amount Yeah, so someone just asked that previously. I think, I mean, if you look by engorgement, sometimes you can tell by how engorged the tick is. And the other way to find out, I mean, depends on your activities, right? If you, as I mentioned earlier, you went hiking three days ago and you find it now, um, then you know it's been 36 hours or, or longer. And I think that's where it comes back to the prevention of, um, I guess, tick-borne illnesses is when you go outdoors and you know you live in an endemic area to do a tick check right after. And um, then it gives you also a bit of a time frame, or have someone else do a tick check. Um, this is another Borrelia species that's becoming more prevalent. Um, I think lots of people probably don't know about this one. So Borrelia miyamotoi is also a boreal, boreal infection that um, similar to tick-borne relapsing fever. Um, also carried by the same ticks. And there are some good prevalence studies in, in the Northeastern US, but also Manitoba. This is from a paper that was published last year that um, in Manitoba, and you see where, uh, where some of um, this Borrelia minamotoi species was found, um, that about 10% um, of patients who had submitted testing for query Lyme disease were um, had serology positive for Borrelia minamotoi. <clears throat> Similar types of symptoms, fevers, chills, headaches, bone joint pains, fatigue, very nonspecific. Um, the testing, yes? I would just point out looking at that map, that's following rivers, which means it's following oak trees, because there's only oak trees in that trouble around rivers. Okay. Oh. And I guess that would be consistent with uh, where you do, where you, the lime, with the um, tick, with the active surveillance where your tick was found here in Kenora region, right? Um, I don't know if there's any oak trees in Sulu Lookout. But... Okay. So testing is, I think, still done investigational only. I'm not quite sure, but again, it's by PCR and serology. I think you have to specifically ask for it. I asked for it once and I haven't actually gotten a result back. Uh, maybe that's worthwhile to clarify with Public Health Ontario what the testing for that is now. And treatment similarly, doxycycline covers it. Another tick-borne infection that's transmitted by the exodus scapularis tick is Babesia. Um, so this is a parasite. Um, I kind of refer to it sort of as a local malaria. So you have sort of like a, a 
same symptoms, fevers, chills, but what you do get is um, same with malaria, you get hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, uh, and hemoglobinuria that you may see. Um, and again, on SMEAR, you, that's how you would diagnose this, you would see this characteristic Maltese cross. Um, this is not a rickettsial boreal infection, so doxycycline won't work for that, but the treatment of choice is atovaponin, azithromycin, or clindanquinine. But just to be aware, another thing that can be transmitted by ticks. And then lastly, as I mentioned, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I mean, we do not see a lot uh, in Minnesota, but um, I mean, just recognizing that it's not the Rocky Mountains, like what people mostly think, but you do see more central eastern US. And I don't know if you do get travelers coming up um, from that region, but um, again, one of the other uh, infections that can be transmitted by ticks. That's what I'm getting at. Chronic Lyme syndrome, does that exist? Well, I think there's no denying that some people do have symptoms. Um, they can be fairly nonspecific, and people may sometimes be left with certain residual symptoms as post Lyme syndrome, which I think it's fairly well established if you look at the evidence that this is not due to chronic infection. Um, there are some I mean, the, if you look at the CDC, the IDSA guidelines, I think AMI is looking at uh, working with PHAC on a, on a statement um, that in, aims to answer that question in more detail, more comprehensively. But at this point, is yeah, no, no, as far as we can tell, no evidence to support chronic infection. Yet. Yeah, so typically we try not to give tetracycline antibiotics to children uh, under eight years of age because of the risk of tooth staining, um, just because it is a treatment of choice, sort of like penicillin for syphilis. Um, we do recommend doxycycline for all ages, Sorry, unless it's really a severe life-threatening allergy or, again, pregnancy where you're worried about like the uh, teratogenic effects. Um, yeah. Yeah. A deer tick on them for more than 24 hours were to give them prophylactic treatment. Now. So the guideline is for 36 hours, but a lot of public health messaging uses 24 hours just to simplify it. Um, so, yeah, we're just based on the tick surveillance information for Lyme disease, prophylaxis, it, it, it would suggest that prophylaxis should be considered for um, individuals who have a tick that's been on for more than 36 hours and they're presenting to you within 72 hours. So you also need to give it within a certain period of time. And they don't have any other contraindications to um, doxy. Yeah. Rampant? Yeah. Okay. So what's the question there? Second line therapy, allergy. allergy. There's not a lot of doxy on Yeah. Yeah, I mean, very few have severe doxycycline allergy. I mean, if they just have a bit of a rash, I think. You can probably work through that just because doxycycline is a treatment of choice. You can also try desensitizing, I suppose, but that takes time um, and it's not easily done necessarily. But yeah, second line would be a rifampin. But for severe infections, um, try to use doxycycline if you can. For Lyme, what is the second line treatment? Amoxicillin. So for prophylaxis, I don't think there's a second line treatment for prophylaxis. So then you just wait and see and uh, um, test if you're concerned. For treatment, um, depending on what stage of Lyme disease they are, but you can treat with amoxicillin. Um, if it's more severe Lyme, you can treat with ceftriaxone. All right, well, thank you everyone. That was really an engaging conversation. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to those online for joining. And and many thanks to Yoko for coming all the way down here. I, I really did. One of the reasons I think I wanted Yoko to come as well is just that you have a face and you know that we have an infectious disease specialist in the region, which is somewhat exciting. So, um, and so definitely. Yeah, so I can, uh, I'm, I mean, right now I'm in Sulokat. I mean, I think if there's demand, I could consider coming here once in a while, um, but I can also see patients by telemedicine or if they want to travel to Sulokat, that's fine too.